What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another video. And today I am joined by a special guest. I'm here with Thaddeus from Regal Change. And he has a channel on YouTube in which he discusses all kinds of topics, uh, particularly relevant to today's social climate and observing people, people's behavior, psychology, but also the sp on the spiritual side of things, what leads people to do certain things, how to become aware of certain dynamics that may emerge when you're interacting with people and kind of getting more in close close with that divine guidance getting more close to god as he would call it so welcome thaddeus thank you so much for being here today yeah thank you for having me yeah so I, as we were talking about before one of the reasons that i got uh your, one of your videos popped up on my feed and it was talking about essentially you know you have some videos on on semen retention you have videos on the Jezebel, the Jezebel spirit, narcissists, and really kind of just going into a lot of issues that men face today when it comes to relationships, but also issues that women may face as well. And so I'd be curious, you know, to start this conversation off, what what is it that kind of alerts you to when you're dealing with people in general? that somebody may not be the type of person, like the type of genuine soul or spirit that you'd like to connect with? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would really look at their behaviors, how they talk, the way that they speak, why that they're doing the way, the things that they're doing, you know, what exactly are they up to? What exactly are they doing with their lives? Are they communicating for a purpose or are they communicating with others just to communicate with other people? Um, for me, I'm the kind of person that I want to make sure that whoever I'm dealing with, I'm building something with, you know, I've got places to be and I've got things to do. So I don't want to waste any time with people that are going to waste my time. And the sooner that you are able to notice who's wasting your time and who's not, and the sooner that you're able to cut those kinds of people off, the much better off you're going to be in general. So I look for certain kinds of behaviors like that and how they communicate with other people and themselves too, because authenticity recognizes authenticity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that like something that you touched on in there is like how they communicate with themselves, how they communicate. Cause a lot of the times you'll see people and, you know, talk is, talk is cheap, really. It's just your actions speak louder than words. And if you're the type of person that's saying that you want to do one thing, but your actions don't align up with that, and it becomes a pattern of behavior, because there, we all have like certain goals or certain things that we want to do. But, you know, we get stress, work, whatever catches up with us. And so maybe we miss certain things. But if there's consistent promises that you're either making to yourself or to the people around you, and you're not fulfilling them, I think that that is a big key indicator that they might not be, they might, well, there's two levels. They might be lying or being deceptive to you knowingly, or they might be deceiving themselves yeah. <laughs> unknowingly. And then, and then you become kind of, you kind of get the, the, the brute end of that because the short end of the stick with that, because they're, they're not capable of being honest with themselves. And so of course they're not going to be capable of being honest with you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the questions I ask myself when I'm dealing with people is how much is this person's word worth? Because if they're not able to really follow through, like what you just mentioned, it's going to be really hard to actually build any kind of rapport or trust within the relationship. And for me personally, I also look to like, how, how are people talking about how they're going to do things? Do they say, Oh, I'm probably going to do that. Or do they say, I will do that? Yeah. So there's a difference. And, and when they say, I will do that, not only are they demonstrating that they have a will themselves, but if they follow through, then that's a determination of how, okay, well, their word is now matching up with their will. And now their will is matching up with their actions. Fantastic. Yeah. Um... Yeah, exactly. And that made me think of something, you know, there's certain phrases that people will say sometimes too, which is like, they'll kind of like, 
in a weird way let you know that <laughs> they might not be the person for you. And, and it could be, again, it could be in any sense of, of the dynamic, but um, I've heard phrases from people that are like, you know, you want me to be something more, or you want me to be more than what I am or more than what I'm capable of being. And I kind of just took it as like, well, yeah, but I also want that. I, I kind of took it a little bit at face value that like, yeah, like, you know, I want to improve. I want to be more than what I am too, though, because I'm, I'm on this path of growth, right? I'm on this path of intentional growth. And I think that's something that all of us should be striving for is to be more than what we currently are. But if somebody is in a fixed mindset, and no matter how much they try, even cognitively, they might be aware that, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to grow. But if again, if their actions aren't lining up with their words, and they keep saying things like that, that indicate, oh, yeah, well, I'm actually, I'm actually cool being here. Like, you want me to be up here, you want me to go up, but I'm, I'm in a, in it's on a certain level, even though I cognitively might understand that, yeah, that I should be striving for that. And yeah, I kind of want part of me wants to do that. I'm kind of just my baseline is here and I'm not really willing to go on this journey with you type of thing. Um, and I don't know, man, there's, there's so many different ways I feel like that people kind of reveal themselves. And I know that some of your content, like you touch on these things, I'd be curious. Uh, you have, you have a, a video here, one of your more popular ones that says how narcissists try to steal your personality. And I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on, not only how they do this, but also why they do this and and also like how to kind of tell that this is what is happening rather than that somebody is actually genuinely admiring you and wanting to put their best foot forward and 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 go on that journey together how what are some indicators in your mind that this is this is actually what's happening? Yeah, that's another good question. I mean, it really depends on the amount of time that you're spending with this person and what you're doing with them. I would be recommending that, let's say, let's say whether you're male or female and you're just starting to talk to someone new and you start to maybe go, I don't know, go, you do some kind of activity together uh, regularly and you start to notice that there's certain patterns or things of ways that they, you know, they, they have patterns of behavior, right, in this kind of activity. Well, you've got to get to different kinds of activities to see and different people to see how they're interacting. Because I had, for me, there was a woman long ago that we, we met at college and I had, we, we weren't really dating or anything like that. We weren't necessarily like in a relationship either, but we did have mutual feelings of some kind. And as soon as I took her around my friends, she started to try to get me away from my friends. Like she tried to like make it seem like my friends were terrible. And, you know, granted, were they the best influence on me at the time? No, probably not. But they weren't the worst either. And, you know, and I was around her friends and I didn't really care for her friends either. And so I I thought about this. I was like, you know, if we're not really caring about each other's friends, <laughs> like the way that like we probably ought to at least be able to get along with, maybe there's not really a compatibility here. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. we kind of stayed talking. We didn't really go any further. But through time, even though we were just friends, which I do not think that men and women can ever be just friends. I don't believe that for one second. Mm -hmm. um, we were just friends at the time. And I started to notice that she would start to do things that I was doing. Like I had certain ways of communicating. Um, I remember one time specifically, like I had like, I had like gotten pretty excited about like, this uh, exam that I had that I had gotten back and I did pretty well. And, you know, I did this motion of like, like, Oh, I'm just so glad. Like, and I noticed that over the next like two weeks or something, she started doing that way more. Like she started mimicking my behavior and my personality. And then I was like, okay, you know, flattery, like imitation is the best form of flattery. Right. Not yes. 
Not in this case. Not, <laughs> not in this case. So she started to like suck my identity away from me. That's what it felt like spiritually, even though I didn't have the words to necessarily describe that. That's what it felt like spiritually. And I just was like, what is happening? Because around her, I started to feel like emptiness. I started to feel like uh, like some something empty in my stomach that I don't usually feel. And I was like, what is going on here? I, and I really didn't know at the time because I was so disconnected from my emotions. And one thing that's going to be very helpful for anybody that is determining whether or not you're actually around a narcissist is, are you capable of naming your emotions or not? Are you capable of noticing where the emotion is in your body? Mm. For example, when I was around her, I felt shame. I didn't know <laughs> what it was called, but I felt shame, like just for being who I was in my stomach. I felt it really deeply in my stomach. And I was like, man, what is this feeling? And when I finally was able to name it, that's when I started to realize okay, I can transcend this and I can turn this negativity into positivity. But if anybody here has been around people where it's like, like I'm sure you've been around this kind of person as well, where it's like no matter what you do, they just continue to show you that they could not give a rat's ass about you and what you think. Mm -hmm. That's when you just have to slowly move away. And yeah. so- you, when you set boundaries and when you start to notice these kinds of mimicries of behavior, when they're literally trying to steal your identity, it feels like, yeah, that's that's one of the ways that you can indicate whether or not that's a narcissist you're dealing with. Yeah, there's a couple of things that you said that are really interesting. I mean, it's tough with the mimicry thing because... I feel like we all do it to, an, to a degree. I mean, even I will do that. If somebody has a certain turn of phrase or a way of doing something, I might, I might find myself, catch myself adopting that here and there. But I think that there's levels to it, right? And when it's like, when it's, when it's such a profound kind of mimicry that you're just like, oh, they're literally using all these phrases and all these words that I use. And now they're kind of recycling them back to me. Or like you said, in that physical behavior, um, I don't know. It's just, it's so tough sometimes to read between the lines. Cause we'd even have, you know, sometimes you'll have like those physical movements, but you'll kind of just do them in a joking way to each other. Um, but the other thing you mentioned though, is identifying those emotions. And I think that that is like a really, really key piece because I could notice when I'm around this, this person, this type of person, it's like, I, I start to feel this unease. Um, this like unsettling feeling and there's certain things that they would have done or said that, yeah, they really do line up with that emotion that you're describing of shame too. It's like this person has er like pulled this feeling of shame and for what, you know, because to me, you know, when you look at the shadow, um, integrating the shadow and shadow work, which has become pretty trendy here on the internet, I'm of the mind that we all have these parts of ourselves, right? But let's be honest about it. So let's be upfront with each other. You know, if, if as much as, as of, a, as virtuous as I might be, there's also, I also have to have the capacity for the opposite of, of myself. And, and so do you, and so does everybody that you interact with. And so being aware of that and open and honest with that, to me, I take kind of pride in acknowledging my faults or acknowledging things that maybe, <laughs> sinful about me or, or things that I, I kind of take, not even take pride in, but I, I like to be like, not turn myself away from that truth, right? I don't want to turn a blind eye to that. Whereas these types of people, I feel like they will get triggered by those things. They will have un disproportional emotional reactions to those things, either in you or in somebody else. And that right there can also be a telltale sign because if somebody, one of your friends, one of your friend in your friend group tells a little white lie or something, and then they come and pull you aside later when it's just you of them, you, the two of you, and they're like, why did this person lie about this? You know, and they tr start to dig at it, dig at it, dig at it. And you're just like, yeah, it was just, I don't know. Like you probably said that for some other reason, but it, it didn't have anything to do with you, but they won't let it go. It's kind of weird. Right. And there's kind of other, other signs that like 
if somebody, if you're watching a TV show with somebody and something happens, um, but then they, again, they have this disproportionate kind of triggered emotional reaction to something. I feel what I've come to understand is that people project a lot of the time and then people like to dissociate what is present in themselves by blaming it on other people. Um, and so that's something that I've noticed. But there was one other thing that you mentioned, um, the mirroring, the emotional labeling, and I forget what else you said, but I think all, all of the all of what you mentioned can be like really, really valid in terms of assessing assessing somebody. I mean, another thing I noticed is like the eyes. The eyes can sometimes be either warm and, and receptive, or they can be kind of very like these cold observing eyes, which are literally just observing to kind of see how they can maybe use use a situation or or I, I don't know how to describe it, man. It's very it's very tough to describe. Yeah. I call it the the dead shark eyes. I like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Because they are literally like dead shark eyes. <laughs> they they're able to like pierce you in a way that you feel a tremble down your spine from the evil that you're looking into. Like that's that's the kind of level that sometimes you you get when you see the the people out and about. And mm-hmm. then also like a you know, like the the fluoride eyes, you could say, where they're just kind of like NPCs. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. they're, they're just there. They're like the, the the lights are on, but nobody's home. Yeah, and then, and then you have the people that you just described with that warmth and that almost with the men, I sense a vitality in their eyes. Like there's a sense of uh, vigor that are the men that are authentic, and then with the women. Um, you know, I usually start off my videos, uh, lately here anyway, with welcoming the GMs and the wives, the godly men and the warm, inviting, feminine, empathetic women. Well, the reason that I say warm, inviting, feminine, empathetic women is because you can see it in their eyes, whether they are that or not. And if they're the narcissist, as far as the female goes, they're going to have those dead shark eyes. but you almost like sometimes i've noticed with women specifically you it's like a vortex that you can get sucked into without even realizing you're getting sucked into because women's nature is of course supposed to, like they're supposed to draw you in as like they're supposed to draw the men in you don't see women just going out and asking all of these men out on dates or anything for a reason whereas the men we were the ones that usually do that um we're the ones that i don't like to say the word probe but we're the ones that are probing and vetting on whether or not the woman is actually supposed to be in our lives or not Mm -hmm. so but but with narcissistic women you can sense that there's like a there's like a drawness like I'm, i'm not sure if you ever experienced this where you just felt like drawn to a woman in a way that you really can't explain and you know the woman is wrong for you like you Mm. know he's not like the person that you want to spend your life with but you're just you're just drawn to her for some reason and that's the what i would call the narcissistic pull it's it's like some some of them just have this um it's not charisma like it's not charisma it's 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 something completely different, but it likens itself to charisma. And that's what you're drawn to. It's not the charisma itself. Um, but anyway, one of I think it might be another aspect of mirroring where yeah. they're kind of seeing qualities in you and giving you these very specific kind of adulating compliments that you've never heard anywhere else. And through their attention, through their focus on you, almost like a, you know, a mother doting on a child giving you that full, full on attention, like tons of it, the love bombing, is what people call it. Mm-hmm. I think it, that's, that has that pull that you're talking about that draws you in. You're like, wow, like this person is seeing all these things in me that maybe other, other people haven't. Right. But I think that what that is, is there, it's done through that cold shark eye obser- observation <laughs> yeah. kind of, and then assessment as to, okay, how can I now utilize all of this to draw this person in? So it's very, it's very, like you said, it can be very kind of like insidious and hard to spot, especially with like covert 
covert narcissist because the grandiose narcissist i've had male friends that are like that right and it's it's much easier to kind of get a grasp on that okay this person is like you know um and that's what you think of when you hear that traditional term but this these other forms are just very it, it just much harder to to realize but i think all the points that you've touched on really do ring true um and are definitely things to be uh, to pay attention to um you have some other content in here where you talk about like they talk you talk about like the chosen ones and you're not the only person that has talked about this and i find it fascinating because in my mind when i think of a chosen one i think of somebody that is intentionally trying to spread their light out into the world and to share that with other people and to, that wants to do it like look we all may have a bit of narcissistic traits and there's a big difference between having certain traits of oh yeah i like attention or i like this or i'm like you know i i do like to take care of myself versus um what we're talking about it's a completely different thing but i think that a lot of uh people and you know yourself included are genuinely wanting to make the world a better place through the work that you're doing here and what why is it that these types of people that we're referring to, these narcissistic type of people, what is it about uh, these light, these chosen ones that that they latch onto so much? And why, like, you have other you have other videos on these topics, and I'd just be curious, like, your what your thoughts are, and and recently what you've kind of any any realizations that you've had about this this whole phenomena. Sure. I mean, I've had lots of realizations, and in fact, I'm no longer using the term chosen ones on my channel. And the reason being is because it's become almost a point of vanity for so yeah. many people on YouTube. You know, people are telling each other, like, how amazing they are when they've done nothing. So <laughs> yeah. You've done shit. Like, right. Who the hell are you to be acting as if you are one of God's chosen people, and yet you've done absolutely nothing with your life. Yeah. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, so I stopped using that term as of like, I think January of this year. I, just to jump in real quick, I think another th reason why people use it is because everyone would like to think of themselves as a chosen one, right? So people will have these messages that's like, for the chosen ones, or like chosen ones, <laughs> yeah. blah, blah, blah. And so everyone's like, oh yeah, that's me. Or everyone wants to believe that, right? Mm -hmm. But go so ahead. <laughs> well, this is like, it's legitimately in the Bible. Like the chosen ones are literally in the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, it talks about how God doesn't really, like we don't choose God. God chooses us. And in the Bible, it also says that the chosen ones are going to be a peculiar people among the civilization. They're not actually... Um, like the reason I'm sure you've met people that just kind of stand out, you know, yeah. they're, they're just different in a good way, but like they've got a screw loose, but in the best way possible, <laughs> that's the kind of, that's the kind of mentality of a quote unquote chosen one. But I no longer use that term because it's been so watered down and so overused. Um, but yeah, you're right. A lot of people want to be chosen. And I, never felt like I was a chosen one. Like I knew that I, that I would always have a purpose and I knew that I had a message to bring forth and I knew I was going to do something great with my life. I know, like I, I've always known that, but I never thought to myself, oh, I'm a chosen one. Like I, I, I never, never thought of it like that. And one of the ways, like, okay, one of the ways that God's chosen people is actually chosen is their healers, as you touched on, right? Well, what exactly is a healer? A healer is someone that has been in the dark, now standing in the light, and now yearns to be a light for those that are now in the dark. Yeah. That's what a healer is. And Jesus says in the Bible that God's people, God's chosen ones, not in so many words, but he says that we are going to be the salt of the earth and that we're going to be like a light on the hill that cannot be dimmed. That's a pretty powerful image. 
And that's, yeah. en that's encouraging as well. And because it just goes to show that like when people say that you have the light of, like when someone has the light of Christ, let's say, what that is really saying is you you have a light of of the source of creation within you because you are connected with God. Because what ultimately salvation is, is a healing process. This is what a lot of Christians actually don't like me talking about this topic because I view it in such a way. Because a lot of people think like the one saved, always saved. It's like, no, 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 no. This is not, that's not what it is. It's a process mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. And I have a different, you mentioned sin earlier. I have a differentiating um, opinion than most Christians because I say I follow Christ. I don't say I'm a Christian. And so my view of sin and repentance are psychological and spiritual, not religious. So the reason that healers, these these people that narcissists are drawn to are attractive to these kinds of individuals is because oftentimes the narcissist who doesn't even know that they're trying to heal themselves are actually trying to heal themselves through you. They see something in you that could bring them healing. But depending on how they've been brought up and whether or not they actually really want to accept the healing. Because this is something that you see Jesus talk about and ask certain people in the Bible multiple times. He says, do you want to be healed? He, he asks the people, like, do you want to be healed? He doesn't say, like, I'm going to heal you. He just says, basically, like, I can heal you if you want. Mm -hmm. So he gives you the opportunity to be healed. And it's kind of the same thing because we are, as individuals that are actually authentic, like authentic individuals, what we really are, are the, the hands and feet of God, so to speak. And so we're going to be acting in the world in a certain way that brings those kinds of hurt people to us whether we like it or not. And so that's where boundaries come into place. That's where protecting your energy comes into place, et cetera. Yeah. Um, why, why do narcissists not want you to have inner con confidence? You have a video titled that. Yeah. So, well, because then their supply source is gone. <laughs> they can't, then... yeah, they can't create anything inside themselves. Yeah. Like, the shame that I mentioned that I was feeling around this woman, that was not mine. That yeah. was not mine. Like, I was, she was taking my energy, spiritually speaking, and leaving me with what she was left with. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, that's like, they, they literally, like, literally, uh, they are like, like the term energy vampires. I'm sure you've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, this is a spiritually legitimate thing. Mm -hmm. I they, agree. They, they literally suck your dry, like your energy dry. And then they go and use it, but then they can't recreate it in themselves. So that's why they don't want you to have inner confidence is because if you have inner confidence, you're going to be able to stand up for yourself. And if you stand up for yourself, you're not going to give them your energy. Yeah, it's weird. It's so weird, man. But I think that you have a, a great point. You know, maybe initially they're attracted to whatever you'd like to call it, healers, um, chosen ones, whatever. People that are emanating this light out to the world that want to you know, make the world like it's, it's positive energy. It's a positive form of energy. It's a generative energy. And like you said, standing on the hill, shining the light, you know, that, that imagery rings true. And so it's like they're attracted to that. Because they want some of that, they want a piece of that. They they're like, oh yeah, I, I you know, I, de I logically speaking, that makes sense. I want to do that. But the more that they're around you, the more it kind of shines a light on the fact that they are not like that, and their jealousy ensues. Their uh, feelings of of envy, maybe, or feelings of the inferiority, um, and then they want to leave you with that same shame that they feel. Exactly. Yeah, it's really, really wild. 
I also think that there is, you know, I'm not, you know, you mentioned before at this, you don't really consider yourself religious. I'd be curious, you know, you said you follow Christ, but not religion. Would you care to kind of yeah. un unpack that a bit? Yeah. Yeah. So I say I'm not religious. I'm ritualistic. It really okay. is, it's really as simple as that. Like which are... in your, okay. So, so what is that? How can you, what does that mean exactly? Like being ritualistic, does that mean that you are, you see this from a spiritual perspective, but not necessarily a, re a religious one? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of religion. Okay. At all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a story in, in the Bible where Jesus is confronted by the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And basically they're questioning whether or not he is really the son of God. And he, they ask him like, well, so like, are you really the son of God? And Jesus says, well, is the baptism of John of heaven or of earth? Because Jesus was baptized by John, who was declared to be a prophet among all of the religious leaders at the time. And so John baptizing Jesus, like, well, is that of heaven or is that of earth? And the Pharisees, the religious leaders at the time, they say, well, if we say heaven, then we say that he actually is the son of God. But if we say earth, then we say that John isn't actually a prophet. Hmm. We say neither. They literally say neither to Jesus. And Jesus says, well, neither do I tell you why, how I get my spiritual authority from. Mm. And I thought that was really powerful because that was another thing that the Pharisees were asking him was, where do you get this authority to say the things that you do? And what Jesus had basically had said is, you don't have any authority over anyone and nobody has any authority over you. You are the one that determines what you submit to and what you do not. Mm -hmm. So when, yeah. go ahead. No, yeah, I will. I just, it makes me think that, you know, ultimately it comes down to, I think, control. Like this is something that I heard this, this lady, Sarah, is L LKD, or I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, but I think the same spirit that is at operation with this, this narcissism or this Jezebel spirit, it's all about control. If you look at the, at the end of it. And I think that the way that religion has been kind of pervasive, uh, pervaded across the earth with these and do this and all this and then using it in the name of of doing of committing like atrocities again it stems from the need to control whereas you said like somebody like jesus in that story you know i'm not super familiar with these stories but it seems to me that jesus you know you even mentioned before do you want to be healed like he's not looking to control right he's he's looking to spread this generative positive message and energy out into the world and that's a, ultimately a decision that each one of us has to make. Are we trying to control others to do our bidding or, or to be self-serving, or are we trying to serve others in a positive manner? Yeah. And that's the kind of way that I would see it as being a spiritual thing rather than a religious thing. Yeah. And it's not to say that you don't have wants and needs. Like we all need water. <laughs> we all need food in order to survive, like and live. Right. Um, we all need to feel connected in some way, shape or form. But what we, but what I really started to understand when I started to really follow Jesus was, it's the love of God that holds the world together. Because that's what Christianity is like, at its core. And again, I'm not Christian. I don't think I don't think even Christ would want us to be Christians, as mm -hmm. far as I can tell. And the reason being is because he wants you to be your own person. Like he, yeah. this is something that you see time and time again in the stories. There's like a story of, I don't remember the exact story, but there's like someone in a tree. It's like messing around in a tree and Jesus actually calls him by name. He says, Hey, Hey, you like, he says the name. I can't remember the name of the person, but he says the name of the person, like come, come down from the tree. Let's talk. Basically never met him, <laughs> but, but Jesus knows his name. Like it's a very personalized connection that you have with the source of creation. 
And that's really what I started to realize. And that's what narcissists also want you to be completely disintegrated from is your own sense of who you are. Like, have you ever ter heard of the term enmeshment? I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's one other thing that narcissists try to do through the trauma bond is they try to make sure that you are enmeshed with them. Mm -hmm. Like they see you as a stock. That's a good way to think about it. You're an object to them and you're going to give them a payout or they're going to hold on to you until you do. <laughs> that's the way that they, they look at you. They literally, narcissists literally cannot see people as people. Like, it's an unfortunate reality. Yeah. There's another word um, for this type of, this type of worldview, like solipsism, which is like, you're the only thing that matters or like nothing else. No, nobody else is like a real human being. And I had a friend one time ex tell me that that's how he, he viewed the world. And I mean, he was like a grandiose narcissist. Um, I think another one, another thing that's, you know, you hear this term like NPC in our modern day, and then there's also this, this is a couple different things this reminds me of, but yeah, the NPC thing, like agent Smith's in the matrix, right? I think that what happens sometimes with these people too is, and, and this is just one viewpoint that I'm sharing here. So this may not be like the absolute exactly what's going on, but I think the people like one of the reasons that they mirror you is because they're they don't really have a true sense of self and they kind of reflect whatever's being projected onto them so if they find themselves in a new group of people like you mentioned this female you get around her friends and her friends you just don't really like them and you can tell they, they obviously are having an impact on her much the same way that she's mirroring them the same way that she mirrors you so probably after she got done hanging out with them you're like what's going on with this right um or the more and more pe that people are around other people that they, they're able to influence each other and there's like this weird madness that happens when people become a part of a group they're like less able to think for themselves and i mean this goes on for like everybody to a degree but i think with these these people they're particularly like susceptible to this and i almost wonder because i've dealt with these people and, and again i'm not religious either but it's almost as if they get into a state where they just look like a hollow shell of a person and like potentially like they've been possessed, like almost like they're, they're putting out like this demonic energy. And I think that maybe it's their sense of self is so weak or so uh, fragile, or there's nobody home. Like you mentioned earlier that it's allowing this like demonic spirits to enter into them in a yeah. weird way. Well, uh, are you familiar with Carl Jung? Yeah. Yeah. Something that he said was people don't have ideas, ideas have people. Yep. I thought that was a really profound statement because it's not just with that. It's as you just mentioned, like demonic possession. Like I've literally seen demons in people's eyes before. There was a uh, a Jezebel, you could say. Um basically a Jezebel is a narcissistic spirit. Uh in the Bible, Jezebel was a woman, the only woman with makeup, by the way, in the whole entire Bible, the only woman that wore makeup, <laughs> but she basically uh, persuaded her husband Ahab to literally give up everything that he worked for, and she seduced him and other men into giving her power, politically and influence, etc. So. She used her sexual prowess to get power. And so I saw in a Jezebel, this was only a few months ago, and I literally saw when I looked into her eyes, it was the most, one of the most terrifying things. I won't say it's the most terrifying because I've seen things that will turn your blood cold, but I saw one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. I literally looked into her eyes and I saw like these black, I don't, like just these black entities trying to reach out to me and grab my light. Oh, wow. It was, it was a surreal experience. And I was completely just caught off guard by it because I'd, 
I had known, like, I've seen this woman around, but I've never looked into her eyes because I don't usually like to look into women's eyes or really anybody's eyes unless I'm determining whether or not I want to talk to them and I want to actually pursue something with them because the eyes are the windows to the soul for sure. I mean, the eyes are actually connected to your, to your brain, literally. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's legitimately psychophysiological indications that you can look into somebody's soul by looking into their eyes. So I looked into her eyes and I saw that and I was just like, wow, this, yep, that's a Jezebel. Stay the hell away from her. She, she is going to ruin everybody's lives. And I've seen her like new guys at the gym every other week, you know, mm -hmm. new guy here yep. guy there. And these guys, because they're so attracted to her, because she's a very attractive woman, like no doubt about it. She's super fresh on the outside. But then you look into her eyes and you see those demons literally trying to reach out to grab you. And it's like, no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. I know. Right. And it's un it's unfortunate like that the messaging in our culture right now is so pronounced in that type of way of all these things, because that's not really what men want. Men want a genuine person that is not going to be super promiscuous and not going to be using their their feminine wiles to manipulate people i mean that's not what any any reasonable like healthy guy is looking for maybe maybe some guys are looking for that for like a one night stand type of thing but nobody no guy wants to get in a relationship with a woman like that that's just a fact well and i think men underestimate how much they want chaos you think so I think a lot of men based, so like I've worked with people all around the world in consultations and such, and I can tell you right now that a lot of people don't even realize how addicted to chaos they really are. And it's, it's more about the adrenaline rush because it's exciting. Like red flags in a woman, let's be real. Like in many ways, it's exciting because you kind of get a thrill because what do they do? They liberate you in many ways. They free you. But what they actually are doing is they're not liberating you. They're actually putting you more into bondage, psychologically and spiritually. Well, could you could you explain what you mean by that? What do you give me give us an example of like a red flag that you think is liberating? Um well, the whole like sexual liberating movement as well. Yeah. A woman yeah. I've literally had women that have told me with husbands by the way like with husbands and with boyfriends mm -hmm. they're like hey you know we can just keep this on the dl basically mm -hmm. yeah and i was like uh no they yeah like, I, they are literally willing to and they're tr they're attractive women yeah i know and I've, I've had the same thing and i'm just always like i have the same reaction it's like no like that's not <laughs> that this is, is not wrong. yeah this is yeah it, yeah and uh, you know anybody that's kind of entertain i think as a guy if you're entertaining that type of thing then a ho you're 100 percent um like what you what you're describing you are you're leaning into chaos you're craving chaos you're craving uh that in a weird way where you're getting some sort of ego boost out of it um <laughs> i was with i was with uh, a woman a couple of weeks ago, actually. And we were, I don't want to get into the details, but my friend comes and pulls me aside and tells me, Hey, she has a boyfriend. And I'm like, really, bro? Like, does she really? Because <laughs> why is she doing everything she's doing? If that's true, you know what I mean? <laughs> I totally know what you mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I don't, I really don't get it, man. I really don't get I think I think that what's happened is it's just been like you're saying these these movements of liberation. That's not what they are, and you're you're hitting it on the head with that. It's it's really, it, it's it's you're creating like a prison for yourself because you're. I I truly believe in like karma, and I believe that what you're doing to another person, you are doing to yourself. And so, if you have a boyfriend or a husband at home, and you're going out and then putting yourself out there and trying to hook up with guys and vice versa it goes for you know men and women but 
we're talking about women right now. That's just you're like destroying the the sanctity of your union with that person. You're destroying the sanctity or any sort of spiritual um any sort of like you could say divine part of yourself. You're just like throwing it in the trash. Mm-hmm. Um and so I, yeah, man, it's it's wild. Um I didn't mean to cut you off with that if you had another point you were making about that. Well, so to build off of that, I mean, men, we, we know as a society that men are capable of cheating and doing these things in relationships. We know that. But what we're not told is that women are just as much, if not more so capable. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. women feel and then they think, men think and then they feel. Mm-hmm. So, and I've mentioned this on my channel, but it's like, the things that I've seen in the last few years, just, you know, getting my body right, getting my mind right, getting more of my finances and my spirituality on point. Like, I'm actually taking care of myself. And mm-hmm. I'm not like, you know, I'm not whatever. I'm just a guy that is taking care of himself a little bit more. And women are noticing. And I literally had a woman that... uh she she told me at the gym she approached me at the gym reasonably attractive she was fairly modest as well she said she followed jesus and i was like wow okay this fantastic thank you god this is great and she was like yeah one of these days one of these days we're gonna have to get together and like we we can pick each other's brain and such and you know i knew what she was insinuating because she was saying it in a seductive way and uh, Mm -hmm. She was implying that she wanted to go hang out outside of the gym. And I, for some reason, when she said that, I got a weird feeling in my, in my belly. I was like, I don't know why, but that feels off. And I'm a person that really feels energy. I don't always feel, um, like, I don't always know exactly the precise tactical, technical thing that's going on, but I can feel the energy. I'm a very instinctual person. And so when she said that, I was like, man, I don't know. Like something's off about this. Something's off about this. Like, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give it some time. That night I had a dream that she had an invisible wedding ring on. And I was like, wow, okay, this is weird. I was at the gym later that day and I'm not going to say names or anything, but I heard her name at the gym as I was walking by to go to the bathroom. And these two guys were talking about hanging out with her and her husband. Now, at the time, I was like, okay, this could be a coincidence, or I could actually listen to what my inner wisdom is saying here. Mm -hmm. And so I just completely steered away from her every time I saw her. And this was only like December. Like, so this is only like five months ago. Uh, I was like, okay, I'm just going to steer away from her. Last month, two months ago, I found out, yep, she's legitimately married. Yeah. And she she didn't wear a ring. She wasn't mm-hmm. wearing a ring when I was talking to her. And she's literally coming up to me, telling her, telling me about how we want to go out. Like, men don't realize, because I used to be the beta male, so to speak, that nobody gave a shit about. I was the guy that, I was pretty much invisible to women up until like three and a half years ago. And you know, I had like certain experiences up until then, but nothing like in the last three and a half years. And I've seen both sides of the coin and I've seen what women are capable of now. And it's yeah. like, it makes me, I don't want to say that I've completely lost faith in having a relationship or creating a relationship, but it's made me more weary about who I actually want to connect with. Like a lot of these women aren't even worth talking to. Yeah. And it's the same I thing for, for men with women. Like a lot of men don't know how to lead their lives. And so we're just at a weird point in our society where things are just everywhere and we need order. We need, we need structure again. In some yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think that um, talking about these things, you know, it's not like, to be on some sort of like moral high horse or anything, but it's just like, it's literally like our, our world is going to, is just devolving. I mean, 
Cause I've had the same types of types of experience, man. And the more and more normalized that that is like, nobody's going to want to get in a relationship. Nobody's going to want to marry anyone when you can't trust people anymore, when it's encouraged to do this. Oh, it's hot girl summer. It's like, no, you're married. You're a married woman. Like, what are you doing? And you know, vice versa. But I mean, for me, speaking as a man, I've had the same types of experiences, you know, like I mentioned to you, just a brief story, you know, my friends will, um, hook up with girls in Vegas and then come to find out later that they're married or they're in a relationship. And, and I've had girls come on to me almost way more like dramatically that are in a relationship. Girls, like for whatever reason, it's like they're, they're, they have a husband or they're married and I see girls at the gym and they're just like looking around, like you're saying, just looking for attention. And I don't know what the deal is with it, man. It's like, look, if you're not happy in your relationship, figure it out with your person, get, break up with them, get a divorce then. But this whole mon monkey branching thing is so toxic and men need to realize too, they need to stop encouraging this behavior. Cause if you know that she's just, and I think I've been deceived with this be before as well. I think that maybe w certain women have maybe not broken up with their boyfriends when they got with me. And then they, they're lying to me though telling me that they broke up with them and it's just it's so it sucks because it's like how do you know unless you're like um yeah it's just really it's a really tough situation to be in because to me dude that that's a huge turnoff to me if you're in a relationship i don't want to have anything to do with you yeah um, i mean so, I've, I've literally gave a note to a woman when i found out that she had a boyfriend and we were talking i gave her a note and i said he is not compatible with women in relationships or talking to multiple men at one time romantically and I just left it at that and just that's you my gave mind. a note to a woman about a man. No, well, no, that was like, I was trying to make it depersonalized. So mm -hmm. like, like, cause we were talking like me and this mm -hmm. woman were talking. And so she, I found out that she was in a relationship. Oh, I see. She was looking to branch over to me. Uh huh. Right. What was going on. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, no. So I wrote on a note to make it like not personal. It's like, he is not, he's not compatible romantically with women in relationships or talking to multiple men romantically. Yeah. 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 Just like, it's not personal, but right. Because right, in, right. in the dating game, like you can't take anything personal nowadays. Um, otherwise you're going to get bitter. Yeah. And I guess, I guess it is tough as a man. Um, in this situation because like of course you have those those like those primal instincts kick in and so like on the one hand you wouldn't mind having like a one night i mean maybe you would maybe you would mind and every every man is sits differently on this but like i know at least for me um in my past and what and whatnot in the moment i'm like yeah this this could be fun but the thing is man it's i don't i think it's a never it's never a good decision like the what the momentary gratification you're gonna get from Ha like being with somebody that's in a relationship dude it's not it's not worth it it's right and again like it goes into you know the more the more intoxicated you are the more likely you are to make bad decisions and all that but like it's not uh yeah man it's just it's gross <laughs> i mean in the bible it's okay for men to have multiple wives like but it's not okay for women to have more than one man and mm -hmm. i never I never understood that and now i completely get it it's like men, like for, for men, women are resources. Whereas for women, men are, are tools of survival. Mm -hmm. And if the man is worth his salt, she only needs the one man. Whereas a, a man, he is okay to have multiple women because like biblically speaking, and I'm not saying like I, I'm a Bible like person i i follow jesus not the bible like mm -hmm. i don't put the bible above jesus um mm -hmm. but i mean there are plenty of instances in the bible where it's the term is polygyny uh mm -hmm. not, not polyamory or polygamy it's polygyny where it's strictly the the a sister wives kind of a thing and mm -hmm. so all of the the women that the man has uh are actually like family and the women feel more comfortable there's plenty of instances where in the bible it talks about this um but anyway yeah. that's a whole well well thing. to that point i mean 
look, that's, there's a lot of things, you know, we've evolved in many ways as a species, but we've also devolved in some ways. And just to be honest, that, that regardless of whether, what, however you feel about it, how, whatever it makes you feel, that survival strategy has worked for thousands and thousands of years. There was in every culture, in every part of the world, a powerful, resourceful man would ha be able to take care of, you know, more than one woman. And everyone was content and happy with that situation. But it's never been the reverse. It has never been in anywhere in human history that the reverse has been true, where there's been one woman with multiple men, and that's worked out like that's just that's just never had. And that's I think one reason why uh, religion and some of these things are have been in all at all corners of the earth. You can find these things because there's a reason that we have certain rules and certain restrictions. And as a woman going around and being promiscuous, you know, there's there's even biological reasons for it, because then you won't be able to know whose child it is. You won't know all these different things. And it's just it's it's disgusting to be doing that. Again, I'm not I'm not saying I don't think either of us are saying that you know, men should be going out here and being super promiscuous either, but it is different. It is different if a, if a, a man also doesn't develop there. We're again, like you said, we think first and we feel later. I think that there's a lot of men. Um, and this goes in, in other societies across the world that will go and go to a massage parlor or whatever, but it has no, it has no impact on the way that they feel about their wife or the way they feel about their girlfriend at home. Whereas women don't really have the same ability because they've developed this emotional connection and it's almost like they switch loyalty to a new man. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in any way, neither of us are saying that are encouraging that type of behavior, but we are saying that there is a distinction, whether you like it or not, there's a distinction in, in biology, the biology of a man, the biology of a woman. And we're just different creatures. Um, we are created differently. And that's one, that's one of the reasons too, why, these societal kinds of progressive <laughs> things of liberation are actually devolving us because we're not honoring those differences between a man and a woman anymore. We're conflating the two and saying, and, and empowering, saying that women are empowered by adopting masculine traits and men are empowered by adopting feminine traits. And it's creating this lack of polarity, which is now, again, like that's distancing us even further because you have to just like a magnet. And in the Kabbalion and the spiritual, the, the teachings of the Kabbalion, there needs to be the opposite pole, the, po the positive charge, the negative charge, the light, the dark, you know, you see it everywhere. And it's the principles of gender, masculine energy, feminine energy. That's what, co that what, that's what creates harmony. That's what creates a coexisting um, kind of a team uh, a and a family unit that can prosper and that can be, you know, the man leading, generally speaking, and the woman following the man's lead is what creates these happy, healthy homes. As soon as you have a weak man who's weak in his principles and his boundaries, and a woman in her masculine, or, or, or you, you get this thing flip-flopped around, now the women are less happy. More, more women are unhappy and on psychiatric medication than any other time in history. More men are committing suicide than any other time in history. So there's clearly a big disconnect with what we think in our society is progressive versus what is actually the, the levels of fulfillment and the levels of, you know, of happiness that people are experiencing in their day to day lives and their relationships. And so again, that's why I think that, you know, having these discussions is very important. Again, like, everyone's free to have their own opinion. Um, but I think that having these discussions and doing it in a way where we're resolution oriented, because it, it's never going to serve either one of us, one of our genders to go in and attack the women or go in and attack the men. It's like, we need to coexist. We need to learn how to coexist in harmony again, because there's been all this division and having these tough conversations, even in the microcosm space of a relationship, that's going to actually save your relationship and having these tough conversations in the macro of look, the men and women and where are we going and how can we go there together to a better place is essential to have rather than just allowing things to continue in this way where it's, it's really entropy, like is what's happening and chaos. And you mentioned that some men like chaos. I think that, that you have a point with that. I know for me personally, um, I do like excitement, but I try to put a label on emotions and I try to, you know, have sometimes it's adventurous, but more often than not, I want peace in my life. And I think that I've heard other women say this lately. Um, there's some, some female YouTubers that the number one thing a woman can do for a man is be his peace. And I truly think that that is a thousand percent true. And any woman, if you are listening to this, if you're operating from that place where you want to be a man's peace, 
he's going to value you more than your weight in gold. He's going to value you more than anything else, that any other trait that you think you could have, any other thing that you think somebody else you heard from some dating coach or you heard from this or that or your girlfriends told you. If you can be his piece, he's going to give you everything that you've wanted and more. And that's, that's, I speak for myself when I say that, but I think I also, if I, if I can speak for other men as well, because um, at least a healthy man, a man that is living in his true healthy masculine, that's what he wants. He wants a woman to be his piece. He wants, um, because the world is already tough as it is. The world, when we're out here working on our businesses, we're out here trying to make shit happen in the world. We want to be able to come home and, or, or be with our, our woman at the end of the night and have peace with her and not enter into a state of chaos, more chaos. Uh, that is the opposite of what we want. So. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that I kind of went on for a, a, a little bit of a tangent there, but um, I see, you know, I really think that, you know, what you're doing with your channel too, is just, it's really important having these kind of tougher conversations because we need to come together again. Like we need to find, uh, like I said, a common ground and, and really just, you know, it all starts with the, the family too, like the family unit and raising healthy children, healthy, happy children. If we're continuing to be in these ways that aren't serving us, it's going to continue to perpetuate the cycle with our, with the, with the children as well. Yeah. And ultimately that's what it's about. It's, it's not about us. It's about the future generations. Yeah. Yeah, and that's again goes back to having that healing energy. You come to the space to heal the space. I came here to heal this place, not to create chaos and destruction here. Because what you're what you're going to be doing is creating a hell on earth. You might have your little bit of excitement and chaos and drama that you that made you feel made you feel things, but now you've created destruction in your relationship. Now, if you have children with this person, now they're going to receive the the end the result of that they're going to be perpetually you know damaged by the destruction that you've caused and um i don't know man it's 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 a sad sight to see but again i think that having these dis open open discussions is probably the best thing that we can do to try to find that you know that new direction to go down yeah i i'm on board 100 <laughs> percent yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, I know that we're hitting the hour mark here. If there's any other things we wanted to touch on, I think one thing that I, that we had talked about before that remember, it made me remember something is um talking about the, the narcissists. And one thing that can also be another key sign. I heard somebody talk about this recently is that by setting boundaries, by telling somebody no, or by saying, Hey, look, like, you know, don't text me at this particular time, you know, and their reaction, if they have this very reactive triggered thing, and then they try to make it on you that you have a boundary that you're bad and wrong for having this boundary. Well, there's another sign that you're dealing with this person who has to have control, you know, any sign that they don't have any, that they're losing any sort of control they'll make you the bad guy and they will, you know, throw it basically like an adult tantrum about it. Um, that was one thing that came to mind. Yeah. I mean, I've literally given my number to women and I've told them to text me or call me during a certain time period on certain days. And if they don't, I just don't answer. <laughs> I just don't even answer. Or, or if they just get upset, then I know, okay, well, then that's, you know, weeding out anybody that's not interested. And that's one of the ways that I vet women to begin with, um, and people in general as well. Uh, just learning how to set boundaries early on is going to be the most important thing. Yeah. And that brings me probably to like, to round out this entire conversation is just like, on a, on a from a men's perspective and a women's perspective, how do you think that we can get back on a, on a better level. Cause I think one of those things is what you're talking about, like setting boundaries, having standards and expectations up front for each other and having those conversations. But I mean, in your mind, like, do you, what, what are some of the things that we can do? Transparency. Uh, this is something I've mentioned on my channel is any good man or woman is going to be transparent. And you know, if a woman asks me if I'm seeing or talking to multiple women, 
and I am at the time, but I'm not dating or anything, I'll say, yeah, I am talking to multiple women. Like, I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. But if I say, like, you know, if I try to lie my way through it, like, I don't believe in lying anymore. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I have faith in my spirit and I have faith in my truth. And I don't even like saying my truth because there's just the truth and then there's falsehoods. But yeah. like my spirit is is the truth in many ways, just as much as your spirit, your experiences are the truth. Only that which you have experienced is to be trusted. So that that's actually something that uh, a sage, um, I'm paraphrasing a sage, Osho. I'm not sure if you've heard Osho. Oh, I've heard of Osho. I haven't read his books, but I really want to because I've I've heard like little excerpts of his and they always are really on point. Yeah, he's a fascinating individual. Fascinating. And I mean, he's he has a lot of great points um, about God and everything. He actually says that there is no God. And I think he means I think he means that in the same way that Frederick Nietzsche means that. Uh, I'm not sure if you've if you're familiar with Nietzsche's. I I have yeah I've I've read some of his stuff, but I'm not like super dialed in with his the whole the entirety of his philosophy. But gotcha. Yeah, he's he's not really a friend or an enemy to religion. He's very neutral. He understands the importance of it. Kind of like my stance too. I feel like yeah, he understands the importance of it, but he's not like he's not for it either. Um, <laughs> and so. So, yeah, so I, I would say transparency would be the number one thing. Be transparent. Like, don't like don't waste your time. This is what so many people are doing nowadays is just they're talking to this person just to talk to somebody. They don't want to feel alone. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. So they're just going to talk to this person. And for all the men out there, the introverted women, like the women that are not talking to everybody, even though she might not be as like sexually a, a, alluring or appealing, I guarantee you that she's going to be more of a a woman to you, if that's really what you want. Mm-hmm. For all the the women out there, if you're looking for a man, a man with principles and values that stands on those and demonstrates that through his actions are going to be the ones that you want to look for. Because a lot of the times, women want to fix a man. They want the control, as you mentioned. They want to control. And it's like, <laughs> good luck trying to control a man that has built himself. Mm-hmm. Good luck. You're trying to tame a lion. <laughs> yeah, it's so, yeah, I know. Um, yeah, and uh, I think, yeah, that, absolutely. And the other thing I think for men and women is like having a vision of what you want, like truly what you want and having that internal locus of control that is truly developed from what it is that you and your heart have chosen that for you, because so many of us are, have this external seeking thing where we want validation from our parents. We want validation from our peers. We're looking for this. We're looking for that. We don't even know what we want anymore because we're, our attention's getting yanked around by our environment, which is constantly changing and other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what is it that you want and what are the qualities that you want in somebody and then having standards for that and being, um, discerning with people like you mentioned a lot of the times you know it's funny because uh i think i think sometimes like people this goes for women but also goes for men is like people will kind of hide their their maybe their true qualities by having like the reverse quality in an extreme so like a man who's just like trying to be like so tough and trying to just puff his chest out everywhere and be super loud well that's actually kind of indicating that he might be insecure it's so a guy that's coming in with quiet confidence that's, you know, like you said, has principles, knows what he stands on. He's he's maybe he's struggling, but, you know, the man inside is being carved through the fire. He's going through the fire to become that version of himself. And that's what you want as a woman is you want that man that's that stands for something, that man that has principles and has his own set of principles and values. And then the reverse being the the women out here that are just so caught up with their appearance and so caught up with their their charm and whatever it might be um those are some you know those are narcissistic traits and you're not going to like the the women that are more feminine truly the true meaning of feminine just going to be loyal and kind and nurturing and truly a genuine soul that you can connect with 
more than likely they're not going to be as caught up with appearances and stuff. But, you know, it's, it's really just using that discernment. And like you said, um, <laughs> it's, it sucks because it's, I feel like it's rare nowadays. It's becoming more and more rare that people are, people are following into these trends that are not really serving them. Um, yeah. but all we can do is all we can do is just try to be aware, try to raise our level of awareness. And that comes through experience too. It comes through experience with dealing with different types of people, um, having a sense of people, which, you know, it's very evident that you do through your videos and through the, the content that you share, but going through those, um, experiences and then having those standards for yourself and what it is that you want to create in your life is going to be, is going to be really important. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything else you want to wrap up with or anything else that you think is important um, to kind of touch on before we wrap up the video, but. No, I appreciate the time and I appreciate just the discussion in general. Yeah, absolutely. Same. I appreciate your time and I appreciate like the willingness to kind of, kind of talk about some, some of these topics, people, they might ruffle some feathers or they might be a little bit controversial, but again, I feel like it's important for people to have these types of conversations and, and people to try to uh, try to see things from other people's perspective as well and, and be open to diff different ways of seeing things and ultimately empowering. This is the, this is the, what you have in your about section to empower people to understand the happenings in the world, socially, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, and empirically. We also talk about psychology, philosophy, um, and whether we can derive any practicality from them for life, fitness, discipline, adaptability. And I love that because, you know, all of that, all of that is true. And if, the more that we can understand and learn and grow, and a lot of that can be done by, by reading or having these conversations and experiencing new things. And the more adaptable and flexible we can be in our thinking, because when we become very rigid in our thinking, then it's like we're, we're not open to see another person's perspective or we're not open to see reality as a whole we're caught up in some like emotional type of thinking that has been perpetuated and maybe encouraged by the environment or by this certain group that you feel that you identify with and the ability to kind of pull out your perspective to find out what it is that you think rather than identifying with this group type of think is an important foundational part of that journey but anyways thank you thaddeus so much for your time um for everybody watching this i'm going to leave all thaddeus links down below uh hit us with a like drop a comment let us know your thoughts on this and hit me with a subscribe and i will see you guys in the next video